the same dates, but uh, <laughs> close to that. Um, and, and it's the beginning of something that we are living, uh, we are uh, looking forward to see what uh, is going on. Is going on. Uh, so, welcome, and uh, uh, I think we can start, uh, uh, leave the floor to Patrizia Viori, uh, <coughs> who's without voice, but, <laughs> but uh, good work. Okay, enjoy, enjoy the sound. Okay. Thank you, Prostantino. Good morning to everybody. I'm very sorry not to have voice for you today, but I'll try my best. I hope with the microphone you can hear me. I'm particularly happy of uh, opening this conference because it was long due. This started from... Uh, was in 2019, I think, when I came, when Daniela invited me to Tallinn to the uh, conference of the Italian Association of um, not Estonian Study, but Baltic yes. Studies. Yes. And it was a very challenging and interesting conference and a very interesting meeting. And I had the occasion to visit at that time the the Lotman archive in Tallinn, and immediately I thought that was an incredibly good occasion to start a cooperation with uh, the center of uh, Umberto Eco Centers, which does not have yet uh, the archive, but we will. So I think that this cooperation can really bring us a lot of interesting results and uh, paradigms confrontation between the two theories, but also between the, the way of thinking and organizing an archive of people like Lotman and Eco, two uh, giants of semiotics and not only of semiotics. And so we decided to have a conference and to build up this, um, this uh, relationship and this agreement. And the agreement indeed went on, but the conference did not because of the COVID. So after two years from the first idea to have a conference, from the first program, we are finally here and I'm very, very happy about it. So um, at, the, at the same time, the cooperation between the two groups went on. So there was a, a project, a European project, that you start building <clears throat> with some of us. Uh, it didn't turn out right, but I hope it will turn right next time, because I think the project was very interesting. And uh, there are good bases to, for our cooperation. So um, but the reason why uh, the, the title of our conference is not only presence of the past, which is our main concern as the group of Torame, which is a center for semiotics of memory, and uh, by STEME, which is the project we are now is uh, run by Anna Maria, but uh, was the project that we started four years ago and uh, is about uh, memory and trauma. Uh, however, there is also a second part, which is the semiotic and digital approaches to memory and heritage, precisely because we think that uh, even the, the, the cooperation, uh, the, the future cooperation between the two work was very interesting to, uh, to think and to work on the digital component of the archives. So I will invite immediately the first speaker, who is Daniele Monticelli. Can you come here? No. <laughs> Daniele is from the Tallinn University. <clears throat> He's professor of semiotic and translation studies uh, at the University of Tallinn. His research is characterized by a large uh, field of interest, uh, which include theoretical and literary semiotics, philosophy of language, translation history, and contemporary critical theory. Since 2003, he has participated in several international research projects in the field of linguistics, semiotics, translation studies, 
And from 2010 to 2012, he has been the recipient of the Estonian Science Foundation's research grant, Translators Reshaping Cultural Repertoire. Thank you very much, Daniele. The title of uh, his conference is Topo Symbolic Dissonance, Rethinking Contested Memorial Sites with Yuri Lotman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I? I think I, I, yeah, I think I must take the air to. Okay. Uh, I forgot. I forgot to tell you that here there are the abstract of the papers, so you can pick them up when we stop. There are two uh, two sheets. They are not linked together, but you can. No, see you not. <laughs> okay. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 We are very grateful, very happy, and uh, very honored to be here and in this wonderful venue and uh, in your wonderful city. Um, so my idea is the, to test the employability of uh, uh, Yuri Lotman's semiotic concepts uh, in the study of contested uh, memorial sites. And uh, here I uh, consider so contested memorial sites as a monument uh, which function as a site for the commemoration of past events, the meaning of which is divisive and becomes a matter of political struggle. Uh, so in such cases, uh, uh, time is generally considered the most important variable for clear reason, because uh, um, the site becomes contested due to historical changes in the social, cultural and political context which provokes changes in the meaning or at least the connotation uh, of the monument in question. Uh, I will focus uh, rather on the issue of space and uh, its relations with meaning and consider its monuments as sites for the inscription of values in space. In this respect, uh, a memorial site becomes contested, I will argue, when the articulation between space and meaning is disrupted uh, and uh, the monument becomes a miss or out of place, fuori luogo, uh, we will say in Italian, which means at the same time in the wrong place and at the wrong time. Uh, this is the reason why, uh, despite uh, Yuri Lotman has developed a theory of history and memory, I will rather focus on uh, Lotman's uh, spatial models of culture and communication, uh, taking the semiosphere as the most elaborate and comprehensive version of, of these models. I argue that Lotman's models are toposymbolic in nature. Uh, that means uh, that they are conceived to capture the relations between space and meaning, uh, dealing not only with a semiotization of space, but also with the issue of continuity and change and the complex di dynamic between continuity and change. This is why I think they are suitable to study the issue of contested memorial sites. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the case I am going to consider uh, today, it helps also to uh, highlight, I think, some limits of uh, Lotman's uh, approach. So the case uh, uh, I'm, I, uh, I'm mentioning and that I have chosen uh, today is uh, a very well-known contested memorial site in Estonia and internationally. And some of the colleagues present today have written uh, articles, chapters, opinion pieces on it. Sorry, I have read them all, but uh, I, I won't have time today to go through all the um, previous research on, on this particular case. So this is the Soviet uh, uh, World War II memorial, originally called the Monument to the Liberators of Tallinn and better known as the Bronze Soldier. 
Uh, so the memorial was inaugurated on September 1947, uh, three years after the Soviet army entered Tallinn on the 22 of September 1944. <laughs> Uh, and this was also the beginning of uh, Soviet occupation in Estonia. So the monument was located, as you see here, in a small green area in central Tallinn, above uh, uh, a burial site uh, of the remains of Red Army's soldiers. During the Soviet period, the bronze soldier became the venue for World War II memorial practices in Soviet Estonia. The monument survived the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union and the regain independence of Estonia in 1991. In 1993, the original commemorative plaques with the text uh, of, the moment, of the monument, the original plaques that, re that read eternal honor to the fallen heroes who fell for the liberation and independence of our country were removed and replaced by new ones that read to the fallen of the Second World War. Yeah. This attempt to resignification and transformation of the bronze soldiers into a generic memorial to all the fallen in World War II actually failed. Um, it failed because on the one hand, the monument was ignored and disdained by Estonian authorities as a symbol of Soviet occupation. And on the other hand, it continued to be a central point of reference uh, for the local uh, Russophone community. Uh, the Russophone community is about 50% of Tallinn's uh, residents. Uh, and it was a location, it continued to be a location for unofficial yearly celebrations of Victory Day on the 9th of May, when the Russophones <clears throat> used to lay flowers at the base of the memorial, as you see here. So the tension between the incompatible meanings of the monument uh, on the one hand, occupation versus liberation, loss of independence for Estonians versus victory for the Russophones, violent repression versus heroic sacrifice. This tension exploded in 2006 when uh, the removal of a, mon of a monument became a priority in the political agenda of uh, some Estonian right-wing parties. The excavations for the exhumation of the soldiers' remains were met by protests uh, culminating in two nights of violent riots in Tallinn and other Estonians, uh, Estonian cities. And these riots brought to the immediate, immediate relocation of a monument from the center of Tallinn to Tallinn Military Cemetery, where it continues to be the site for World War II commemorations for the Russophone community in Tallinn. So let us now move uh, to Lotman's theory. Uh, in uh, the toposymbolic framework of a semiosphere, cultural and social tensions are conceived in the terms of the relations between the core or the center and the periphery of a semiotic space. In Lotman's conception, the semiotic space is heterogeneous, as we know, it is crossed by different degrees of translatability between different languages uh, and systems that are included in it. So this means that unity and identity are not originary in the semiotic space, but they are the result of a toposymbolic process of homogenization in which the boundaries between uh, the own and the foreign, what we are and what we are not, what is part and what is not part of a semiosphere are drawn. In this process, uh, one of the languages of a semiotic space comes to occupy a central position, and this starts to function as a meta language for what Lotman calls the self description of the entire semiotic space. So Lotman described this, uh, described this, self, this self description also as the ideological self portrait or the mythologized image which a culture makes of, the, of itself. However, uh, the toposymbolic process through which boundaries are drawn and self description emerges, they do not ex exhaust uh, the dynamism and the tension in the, in the semiotic space. And this is uh, why, um, well, this is because uh, uh, 
while the self-description rules at the core of a semiotic space, uh, its grasp uh, does not extend to the periphery. It does not reach the periphery. And in the periphery, identity and belonging are questions. Or as Lotman writes, in the periphery, our language may appear as someone else's language, and someone else's language may appear as our own. So there is this uh, uncertainty and indeterminacy there. This is why Lotman also defines the periphery as a structurally neutral place where things may happen which are incompatible with the self-description at the core of a semiotic space. So the topological and the symbolic are here two sides of the same coin. Uh, as we can see in this passage from uh, the semiosphere, uh, I quote, uh, when the semiosphere identif identifies itself with a simulated cultural space, the cultural space which has reached a state of self-description and where the boundaries are drawn, then the spatial distribution of semiotic forms takes the following shape in a variety of cases. A person who, by virtue of particular talent, assistance, <coughs> or type of employment, blacksmith, miller, executioner, belongs to two worlds, operates as a kind of interpreter, settling in the territorial periphery, on the boundary of cultural and mythological space, whilst the sanctuary of culture confines itself to the deified world situated at the center. Here is quite nice to see these uh, correspondences of a topological uh, nature of a spatial model and the symbolic uh, one. So um, now, um, going uh, uh, back to, um, ah, sorry, the fact, uh, uh, it's important to notice still that the fact that the semiotic space has a center and the periphery means that it always contains some non-systemic elements. And this internal difference, the core and the periphery, keeps the semiotic space dynamic and open to change. This is what we but let us now test uh, the explanatory potential of Lotman's uh, topo symbolism on the bronze soldier case. Uh, so I argue that the transformation of a bronze soldier into a contested memorial site was provoked by what I call a topo symbolic dissonance. Uh, that is a problem in the articulation of space and meaning uh, arising from the radical changes in the relation between the core and the periphery of the Estonian semiotic space after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the erection of a monument on the site of Tony's May in central Tallinn uh, in the early post-war years of Soviet occupation is toposymbolically transparent, yeah? uh, as the, special, the spatial setting and the symbolic value of the monument make a perfect uh, match. Yeah? This is the new sanctuary, this is the symbolic function at the core of a capital city, a topological function, the monument to the liberation of Tallinn from the Nazis represents the legitimacy of Soviet occupation called liberation uh, of Estonia, and it becomes the central site of the most important ceremonies and rituals of a new regime. Thus, it's a sanctuary, yeah? thus embodying the new self-description of Estonia as a Soviet country. Yeah? Uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when the previous self-description of Estonia as an independent country temporarily occupied by the Soviets is reinstated, a fundamental gap opens between the topological and the symbolic import of the monument. Uh, so contrary to other monuments of the Soviet era, as the status of Lenin, for instance, uh, the bronze soldiers remains in its place in the center of Tallinn, uh, but at the same time, its symbolic value radically changed. It was no more a monument to the liberators, but a monument of the occupants, uh, often associated in political discourse with a Russophon community living in Estonia and continuing to celebrate the 9th of May, the Victory Day, as in Soviet times. So the monument uh, offered, we could say in Lotmanian terms, hospitality to 
to a series of practices and symbols which were uh, incompatible with a self-description dominating the semiotic space of independent Estonia, post-Soviet Estonia. It became, in other words, a symbolic periphery, but instead of being relegated to the margins of visibility, it continued to occupy the core of the capital city, uh, the space where the new sanctuary of culture should have been, and actually was in a way, if we consider as such the new building of the uh, Estonian National Library open, opened in 1993 at only 20 meter, meters from the bronze soldier. So now, uh, this is simple yeah, in a way, uh, but now I wish to argue that the toposymbolic dissonance provoked by the missed removal of the bronze soldiers in 1991 does not end here, actually. Yeah. And what comes next uh, already alters the nature and functions of a semiospherical periphery in a way which I think goes beyond the grasp of Lotmanian categories. Um, but at the same time, it is of fundamental importance to understand not only, not only the bronze soldiers' case, but the toposymbolic relation between Russia and post socialist Eastern Europe more generally, and today too. As we have seen, for Lotman, the periphery being free of self-description and structurally neutral is capable of, of offering hospitality to phenomena which are incompatible with uh, self-description dominating the center of a semiotic space. Here lies, for Lotman, the creative potential of internal difference, core periphery, um, as the periphery functions as Lotman says, as a reserve of polyglottism and the pl plurality of languages for Lotman, the precondition for the generation of new meanings. However, uh, I would say the kind of uh, toposymbolic dissonance which the bronze soldier generated after 1991 uh, makes it difficult to consider the site as a structurally neutral place. Uh, the memorial site continued uh, rather uh, to be a part of that other self-description which, which was imposed by Soviet occupants in 1944 and which still resonates in the self-description of another semiosphere, the one that uh, today is on Moscow's ideologues define as the Ruski Mir or the Ra Russian world. Yeah. And the Ruski Mir uh, is a strange, in a way, toposymbolic, it's not strange, <laughs> uh, it's peculiar, so toposymbolic construction, uh, the topography of, of which is not clearly defined, uh, but it certainly includes, in addition to the Ukraine, the former, the other former republics of the Soviet Union, and at least I would say Poland too. So on the symbolic level, the core element of the self-description of a Ruski Mir is the victory in World War II and the liberation from Nazis that the bronze soldier celebrates. The toposymbolic dissonance of a monument after the regain independence of Estonia is thus reflected also in the ambiguity of its peripheral status. On the one hand, it is an internal source of differentiation and polyglottism vis-a-vis -vis the self-description dominating independent Estonia's semiotic space, which pushes the Rus Russophones to the margins. On the other hand, such periphery uh, lays at the symbolic core of an alternative imperial self-description, the, Rus the Russian word of the Ruski Mir, which claims its central self-descriptive role for Estonia as well as the rest of Eastern Europe. So, a self this, and this self-description, well, is a bigger self-description there with the bronze soldier is still at the center, and this self-description is unfortunately incompatible with the independent Estonians self-description. Uh, so they cannot possibly coexist, as we are witnessing in the case of Ukraine. 
So here too, uh, the, topo the symbolic and the topological, the topological are not connected yeah? or are uh, dissonant. And they are not concentric or they are dissonant. But the other way around in comparison with a semiotic, with a semiosphere of independent Estonian, because here uh, the wrong soldier is at the core of a symbolic self-description of a Ruski Mir, but it is at the periphery of its imperial topography. So I would I suggest to um, I suggest that this this spatial constellation evidence is a function of a periphery that Lotman disregarded. The periphery is not only a space or a place for structural neutrality in betweenness and accelerated semiotic activity which struggles with a more conservative center and possibly replaces it, provoking innovation and dynamism. But the periphery may also become a place of passive replication of practices and values imposed by the center. Uh, so I suggest to call this configuration, the configuration of a Ruski Mir in this case, the imperial periphery. Uh, this was the Soviet topo symbolic understanding of the relations between the satellite republics, Estonia included, and all the socialist bloc with the imperial center in Moscow. Uh, as the ubiquitous erection of World War II memorials to, to the Soviet liberators in the post-war period clearly illustrates. And this is Putin's regime's topo-symbolic understanding of the relations between the Russian minorities in former Soviet republics and the imperial center in Moscow as the, regi the regime's backed replications of imperialist practices and symbols around Soviet World War II memorials in Eastern Europe clearly illustrates today. So the relocation of a bronze soldier from the center of Tallinn to the military cemetery in 2007 was meant to put an end to a topo symbolic dissonance that I have tried to describe. The new location is topographically more peripheral, both as a space, but particularly as a place. The concluded past of a grave uh, was meant to neutralize the disquieting combination of death and life that characterized the monument in its former location in central Tallinn. The new location was intended then to frame uh, the practices going around the monument in the terms of that commemoration of a fallen, which was at the basis of a failed attempt to resignification of a monument at the beginning of the 1990s. But the story does not end here, unfortunately, uh, I would say, uh, as the Imperial Center continues to haunt the apparently pacified so periphery. So what we see is that uh, the symbolic elements uh, of the self-description of a Ruski Mir, like, for instance, the ribbon of St. George, uh, the flag of a victory in Second World War, and the flags of Imperial Soviet and present Russia continued to accompany the Victory Day celebrations by Russophones at the Bronze Soldiers, also after the relocation of a monument to the military cemetery. Following the war in the Ukraine, Estonian authorities prohibited the use of any hostile symbols during the 9th uh, of May commemorations this year. Here are the explanations about this uh, on the uh, web page of Estonian Ministry of the Interior. While Umberto Eco wrote in the 1970s of a need for a guerrilla semiologica against mediatic manipulations, we can speak in the current case of a semiological warfare conducted by states around memorial sites and related rituals. So concluding, uh, I think that Lotman's spatial models offer us on the one hand, fruitful tools to describe the topo-symbolic processes that turn 
memorials into contested site and also their impact on the semiotic space and its inhabitants. Nevertheless, uh, uh, Lotman's theory seems, uh, and we can discuss it, at, the, at least it seems to me, to lack the instruments to describe the power relations between the center and the periphery in imperial terms, terms uh, of uh, imperial terms of subjugation and replication and the tensions which arise when the same periphery is shaped by two different and incompatible semiosphere, as in our case, post-Soviet independent Estonia and the Ruski Mir. This means, among many other things, that uh, the peripheral, the marginal, the minoritarian, the in-between, and this is a self-critic that I am doing to myself in a way, all these things are not always the place the places of sub <laughs> subversion and change, uh, but they may become the sites of a semiological warfare between incompatible self-description. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Daniele. It was a really challenging and stimulating reflection on the Lockman theory, as well as the theory of, uh, let's say, empirical research on the place and the symbol of monuments, which is the core of most of us are working. So, as you know, the discussion will be not at the end of the session, but at the end of the morning. So we can discuss you now, but I'm sure okay. we will Thank you. discuss you later. <laughs> so I call Anna Maria Lorusso for a presentation. <clears throat> Anna Maria Lorusso is, uh, I think we all know her, is a colleague and, uh, and a friend of the University of Bologna, where she teaches uh, semiotics, uh, cultural semiotics, and many other things, as everybody in Bologna has to teach, many different titles. And uh, um, she is a um, director also of the, um, the Master in Editoria Cartaceo Digitale at the University of Bologna, which is a very interesting master which was invented and created by Umberto Eco, and that now Anna Maria is uh, <coughs> directing in a very, in a very effective way. And um, she's also now the investigator, the principal investigation in the project Spain. Uh, we have here some of our friends from Spain, from Argentina and Colombia, and this conference is also directed to them. And uh, a research interest, I focus on, uh, first she starts on uh, rhetorical and discursive dimension of culture. Irony was her first object of, uh, of inquiry. Then uh, she worked on collective narrative, uh, discursive modes of stabilization, uh, stereotype and cliche. And, um, but I would describe her work mainly as uh, cultural semiotics. And she published uh, many books, uh, Cultural Semiotics for a Cultural Perspective in Semiotic in 2015, then post Verita, uh, between reality TV, social media, and storytelling, which is in Italian. And a new book is mm -hmm. going to be published <laughs> on common sense. So thank you, Anna Maria. And the title of her talk is uh, Memories, Cancellations, Censorships. Thank you, Patrizia, and thank you for the invitation uh, to Francesco in particular. I would like to share some reflections in the light of the Lotman thought on memory and forgetting. For some time now, uh, I've been focusing my attention uh, on the pole of uh, forgetting or oblivion, um, prompted by two phenomena that I would like to mention uh, right away by way of introduction. Uh, we all know that uh, one of the most talked about contemporary phenomena is that of the cancel culture 
it is as if uh, on a social and cultural level a duty to cancel memory as urgently emerged, which strikes me as an interesting phenomenon given that we come conversely from a few decades in which the duty of memory was fundamental. On the other end, this uh, positive evaluation of um, oblivion also emerges at another label, namely with respect to the uh, web and in relation to mostly personal stories. In fact, we speak today of the right to forget, to highlight the fact that in some cases it is right to make information unavailable and to forget it. So I don't know if uh, they are in a way, I don't know the same thing, but uh, if they have something uh, in common. No? And so I'm uh, working uh, and thinking uh, uh, about. Uh, so it's a work in progress uh, where I share with you some some thoughts and uh, I, <clears throat> I wait for your reaction. Obviously there is a, a reference for me in this kind uh, of uh, reflection that is uh, the, the book and the essay by Connerton about the seven types of forgetting. And uh, here we have the list. Uh, um, in this case, uh, um, not all the kind, the type of forgetting uh, are in a way forced or imposed from outside. In my case, on the contrary, I'm uh, uh, just interested uh, in case where forgetfulness is somehow forced and uh, imposed. And uh, in this sense, to mention uh, another uh, essay, uh, very another reading uh, very useful for me, not the only one, uh, I will refer also to other essay, is um, mm, an essay uh, uh, entitled Semiocide, an introduction to semiotics of the extraction of the meaningful by Mehmet Emir Uslu in Science System Studies. And uh, it was very uh, an inspiration for me. And uh, I think that the category of semiocide uh, is uh, useful in the way uh, um, the author speaks about that. So let's start with uh, Lotman, that is uh, the, the reference uh, uh, of some uh, of my reflection. We know Lotman gave a positive valorization uh, of forgetfulness uh, in on semiotic mechanism of uh, culture of 1971, quote Witospensky, indicated three ways uh, through which cultural growth, uh, the quantitative increase of information, the redefinition of information already held, and forgetfulness. But later in uh, 1985, uh, in a way he reformulates this position um, in a more interesting uh, manner to me, uh, this, is, this is a quotation from a, uh, from a essay that is in the English edition of Semiosphere. Every culture defines its own paradigm for what should be remembered, that is, preserved, and what should be relegated to oblivion. The latter is erased from the cultural memory and apparently ceases to exist, but time changes along with systems of cultural codes and paradigms of remembering and forgetting. That which is declared to be truly essential can turn out to be somehow not essential and subject to forgetting, while the not essential can become essential and meaningful. So before the use, before in the first reflection uh, and in the first quotation, the usefulness of forgetting seemed to me to be on a quantitative level uh, with an image that was perhaps a little schematic culture as a repository a reservoir. Uh, Why in this definition, much more relevant in my opinion, now uh, what is a stake are cultural codes and the paradigms of remembering. It is therefore not a question of maintaining or erasing and forgetting, but of enhancing and not enhancing. 
some forms become not essential and only apparently cease to exist. In short, this second definition, uh, Lopman thinks of memory and forgetfulness uh, as a matter of cultural valorization, not of storage. And I think it is important to emphasize this because I believe that the metaphor, the idea, the, scheme, the mental schema of memory as a deposit is still very much alive in the widespread sensibility and should therefore be overcome. The problem is not so much to create space for the new. Uh, the problem is that the, the, the culture needs a dynamism uh, and in order to be alive, uh, culture changes and thrives on internal conflicts. So it's not a question of availability of space. And this was clear also in one of the theses by Lotman and the other the thesis 13, culture as a field of social conflict and the struggle for collective memory is a part of this social conflict, uh, socially prescribed norms of memory and forgetting uh, are a main uh, issue of uh, reflection. So in the light of these premises, uh, I would like to share <laughs> some thoughts on forgetfulness. Um, the starting question is how can a society, a culture, really actually forget uh, uh, very often a uh, fundamentally psychic uh, in individual model of memory and forgetting is transposed on a, to a cultural level, but not always and not in all the cases uh, does the modem hold. It seems to me that we can highlight uh, three prevalent or recurring forms of forgetfulness strategies, uh, which I call in provisional but uh, hopefully clear enough terms uh, covering uh, deletion and deactivation. Uh, this issue is very close to the, uh, this issue and also this uh, uh, classification, this typology is very close to uh, this that was addressed in a very uh, in another very important uh, uh, um, essay for me in uh, this field, that is the, the article by Francesco Mazzucchelli uh, uh, in uh, the journal Versus uh, <clears throat> about the ways of sign destruction, uh, where Francesco told about defiguration, iconoclasm and disinvention that uh, have uh, many <laughs> points in common uh, with uh, these terms. Uh, and uh, we also spoke about uh, these issues uh, more recently at the uh, Lutpanian conference uh, in February as Trame group, uh, uh, where we presented the four semiotic mechanism that uh, characterize uh, the redistribution and translation of text and values, uh, values uh, within the semiotic uh, there we were uh, Patrizia, me, Francesco, Mario and uh, Cristina De Maria and uh, we indicated the four, uh, four types of um, re-elaboration uh, which were domestication, erasure, erosion and uh, recollection. So I'm, uh, I, I'm keeping to uh, think about uh, this uh, category in order to uh, organize uh, uh, a typology that, uh, for my mind, can, can work. So the first, uh, the, the first kind uh, of uh, um, forgetting cover, this is a, a Cover, covering uh, is the name uh, that uh, I found uh, to, in order to express a kind of transformation, actually, not a real destruction. This is a rather paradoxical strategy of oblivion, uh, uh, in my opinion. Uh, in this case, in fact, the construction of oblivion, the, the making of oblivion passes through a clearly conservative practice, which plays on coverage in the semiotic sense, as one covers the meaning of something by transforming it. 
One of the most uh, uh, interesting and sensitive for the present example, in my opinion, in my opinion of this uh, uh, kind that I have in mind uh, is uh, the, uh, the statue of Lenin uh, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, Nina was transformed uh, in uh, that uh, rather from Star Wars. Uh, yeah, the process uh, of uh, the Sovietization uh, in the re recent history of Ukraine and uh, a law was banned, uh, a symbol of reference praising uh, communism in the country which uh, obviously includes statues such as the Vladimir Yenin in Odessa, this statue is in Odessa. And so the local uh, artist Alexander Milov decided to transform the statue of uh, Yenin into a commemorative Darth Vader. This type of intervention does not seem to me a, a real strategy of forgetting even if uh, it, it is elaborated in this frame in Ukraine, we had a law that asked to eliminate the, the monuments to Yenin and to the uh, heroes, uh, Soviet heroes. So even in, if uh, it is in this frame, uh, it seems to me that it's not a real, uh, uh, it doesn't correspond to a real strategy of forgetting because the trace of the transformed text one, Yenin, remains very evident and very active if we, if we uh, don't understand that this is a transformation of Lenin, the sign doesn't function, the new monument doesn't function. So we are in a process of overwriting that is also <laughs> clearly an ironic process. So this is why I mention this case uh, as a perfect example of what I call the strategy of covering. But the second kind uh, uh, of strategy I mentioned it was the actual deletion or destruction. And uh, I think to process uh, like this one that uh, uh, Daniele already uh, showed. Uh, so uh, the case uh, where uh, the, some statues, some monuments are uh, pulled down. Uh, <clears throat> in, uh, uh, in the forms that this pro process is taking today, seems to me uh, that the, the forgetfulness uh, is uh, very unsuccessful because uh, uh, the polemical dimension uh, is so central, uh, so crucial uh, that uh, uh, the, the strategy becomes indical when cancellation uh, is programmatic and shouted, uh, as in these cases, uh, the, the strategy become ostensive uh, in uh, semiotic terms. Uh, so it's uh, uh, again, uh, we have the paradox of remembering and not uh, of forgetting. And uh, I quote in this regard a passage from uh, Lotman again that uh, makes uh, uh, this very clear. No. Uh, no, I haven't it, I read it, uh, is in the portrait uh, um, that uh, in Italian is uh, in Il Girotondo delle Muse, is an essay <clears throat> of 1998, the, uh, in, published in 1998. The ancient anecdote is well known that Erostratus, who for the sake of glory had destroyed an ancient temple, he was condemned to eternal oblivion. Following this decision, the Greeks continually repeated that Erostratos must be forgotten and ended up learning well the, his name. Likewise, in the overall appearance of the military gallery, 
the green panels also helped to firmly eternalize the faces of the disgraced decabrists. So uh, to keep to repeat, to forget someone or to make a sign to forget someone is, uh, <laughs> uh, is a way to remember it and uh, to uh, end up learning well the name uh, you were supposed and you were are, you are asked to forget. So, in short, the relation uh, as a performative obstetrically obstetrically dim dimension, which <clears throat> can certainly open up a, a social debate, the struggle for social, uh, the social struggle Lotman spoke of, but certainly does not condemn its object to oblivion, rather than a practice of forgetfulness or oblivion, we have a practice of iconoclasm, which is something else, and uh, it is something uh, very, uh, ad, that produces uh, a lot of discourses, uh, so uh, and not forgetfulness. But there can be, however, obviously less shouted delation, which uh, do not lose the erosive quality, uh, quite the contrary, and uh, yet, in my opinion, they completely change their meaning from a semiotic point of view. The goal of erasure remains, but the ostentative dimension is missing, the polemical nature is missing, and instead a reconciliatory function dominates. And uh, I want to mention here a case uh, involving uh, one of our project partners in Speme, H401, uh, who I spoke to recently in the past few weeks uh, in Amsterdam. H401 is a foundation that uh, deals with uh, how we as society, organizations and individuals with layered past want to deal with the present and the future. This is the auto description they give of themselves in the website, in, the, in their own page. At one point, uh, some years ago, it emerged that one of the guests uh, of the living uh, in the monument house uh, that the foundation uh, uh, has, had engaged in a non-transparent, in some cases criminally punishable, conduct involving minors, sexual harassment or something like that. In order to provide clarity and as a sign of willingness to shed light, the foundation set up an independent commission of inquiry to clarify what happened. The commission was for many, many months, uh, clarified which crimes uh, uh, there were and gave a number of recommendations. Among this recommendation, and uh, uh, some weeks ago, I discussed a lot uh, with uh, our partner there, there was one recommendation that was a cleaning room of the traces uh, of uh, this person. So change uh, the, the room, it uh, has not to, uh, to stay as it was uh, when uh, these crimes happened. And they changed the name of the foundation. Uh, actually, the first name of the foundation was Castrum Peregrini, and now is H401, that is a very neutral uh, name because corresponds to the address of the, of the place. So, in a sense, we are in the area of cancellation practices. So when, uh, when I spoke with uh, these colleagues uh, in Amsterdam, telling them uh, I'm uh, uh, working uh, on the subject of uh, forgetfulness, cancellation, erosion, uh, they told me, you have to talk about H401, because this is a case of uh, uh, erasure. But, uh, in my, in my opinion, this is something very different from the destruction of a, of a statue like uh, this case. It seems to me something closer to the damnatio memoriae of antiquity, where it 
was often a matter of eliminating names uh, and never naming them again. And here too, we have a problem with uh, the name. Um, but the process, uh, uh, this process of elaboration uh, was not conducted uh, from below, but uh, indicated uh, by a competent subject entitled to express a judgment. So like in the, damna in the ancient uh, Damnatio Memoria, there was a, <laughs> an institutional subject. Uh, and this intervention uh, was much less shouted uh, than the pulling down of the statue. And, doesn't not have the visibility of a socially participative process, uh, like in removing the statue. On the contrary, the commission of experts uh, who studied the cars, the, the, the documents, uh, the evidences, uh, uh, made recommendation just for those running the foundation. So it was not a very public, uh, uh, a very public uh, process. Then what happened uh, from the Nazio Memoria requested, the, the process uh, has become something uh, different again because uh, there was a social negotiation in a way. The foundation agreed to change the name. I told that uh, you uh, give up to the name of Castrum Peregrini, but refused to clean up the flat and to transform it. So they did not fully comply with the cancellation order and they tell everything that uh, happened on their site, website, informing uh, uh, about uh, all the available elements. So the foundation did not delayed, uh, delayed in order to get rid of, but change it in order to respect the victims without forgetting and uh, telling uh, this, uh, this uh, story and this process uh, uh, very clearly in the website where is available also the, the document uh, uh, by the commission uh, by the commission. So this case seems to me closer to some claims of contemporary right to be forgotten uh, or some case of restorative justice. We know it happened, something uh, wrong happened. We say it, we admit it and we try to move on. It is still a form of ca cancellation uh, and uh, uh, Peter, I talk about that, but uh, a restorative cancellation we, which doesn't cancel the account of what happened. So we, uh, we, here we are close to the third typology I indicated, I think, uh, which from a semiotic point of view is very close to the ideological discourse, the disactivation and suspension. In a way, this is the most dangerous mode, I think, so perhaps also the most effective. Um, and uh, Umberto Eco was very aware about that in uh, the book, The Tree and the Labyrinth, where uh, there is an important essay uh, at the beginning about uh, memory. He said that the most important thing is the accessibility, availability of the information. Uh, uh, actually, he said that the problem is not the culture light and their encyclopedias by selecting, which is a physiological phenomenon, but that what they have placed in latency can always be recovered. So the dangerous uh, efficacy of the activation is precisely that it complicates recovery. It does not destroy the signs, but makes them untraceable, as if by clouding possible paths. This practice of disactivation uh, is a very difficult uh, one, I think. It's not a punctual practice uh, with a defined agentivity. The activation is built over time. And if I have to think of a recent, recent more or less case, I find that one of the most corresponding uh, one, uh, cases uh, related to, the, uh, to this uh, disactivation uh, 
is about the memory of Italian colonialism, which in some ways has been completely deactivated uh, because uh, we don't know uh, about uh, about uh, Italian responsibility. We don't have them in mind. And uh, this is uh, just one uh, uh, example. Um, there is an important uh, cinema prize in Italy, the Coppa Volpi, that is one of the most important prizes of the uh, Biennale Venice Film Festival. But uh, this Volpi is uh, a fascist uh, minister uh, but uh, we don't know that, uh, and uh, we have entitled the prize that is still there and uh, is still so important uh, for Italy, and uh, we uh, we can't make the connection with the heritage of this name. Uh, this strategy can only be implemented, in my opinion, by way of narrative, uh, through an alternative narrative that uh, shifts attention, uh, perhaps becoming so strong that it prevents the activation of other uh, NATO. So it has not an obvious polemical intent, uh, but uh, it offers another different uh, pertinence. Uh, and uh, here I go back uh, to conclude to quoting Gecko, who sums up in a few words something that uh, might actually seem very counterintuitive. A text, uh, besides being a tool for inventing or remembering, is a tool for forgetting, or at least for making something latent. So forgetting is something built uh, not through absence, but through multiplying <laughs> uh, textualities, uh, multiplying discourses that shift the attention. To go to the conclusion, uh, conclusion one minute. I think that uh, today practice of oblivion and erasure are on a spectrum, big spectrum, ranging from negation of meaning to iconoclasm to damnatio memoriae to ideology discourse uh, as in this last case. And uh, in my effort to work on a semiotic typology of uh, strategy of deliberate forgetting, uh, I'm thinking about the semiotic dimensions that we should have in mind uh, to build uh, uh, in the, the wake of Lothman uh, a typology. And uh, I think that we should work and we should think uh, uh, at least uh, uh, to these five uh, uh, dimensions the, um, in these practices of erasure. The work these practices make uh, on the sign function, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we can keep the, the level of the, of the expression and change the context, we can destroy the, uh, the element of expression uh, and so uh, change the content. Uh, we can suspend the function at all uh, in uh, its relation, expression, expression and content. We have different possibilities. Then the work on the agentive dimension, this was uh, taken uh, in account also by uh, Connerton, uh, uh, the, which is the subject of these practices, can be an institutional subject uh, or can be a, um, an anonymous subject uh, or a single individual, and it um, changes uh, very much. The work on normative dimension, in some cases, uh, the uh, uh, erasure practices uh, are, uh, are demanded by the law of a country. So, uh, the, uh, the Sovietization of Ukraine uh, was uh, this uh, kind of case. In other cases, these practices are uh, against the, the law. So there is a very different uh, attitude uh, towards uh, the, the normative uh, uh, level. The work on the co communicative dimension, what I mean, uh, there, are, there is the, the Paul Sine backstage uh, that uh, uh, 
changes very much the identity of these practices because in some cases uh, the subject of these practices want to be on the scene uh, on the <laughs> uh, on the stage and uh, in other case they want to be on the backstage and uh, not to be seen and it is another relevant dimension finally a very uh, lotmanian dimension the metalinguistic work there are cases where the metalinguistic dimensions uh, is uh, very strong and in other cases uh, uh, is uh, not so strong. Uh, and uh, what I mean with metalinguistic awareness, <laughs> the idea to fix uh, and to explicit the, the meaning of something and to give a norm of uh, interpretation in order to fix the meaning of something. And uh, again, in some cases, this is one of the goal of uh, this strategy, fix meaning or uh, to go against some fixed meaning. In other case, we have uh, the awareness of uh, uh, dynamism much, uh, much stronger. So, as I told you, it's a work in progress, but I'm uh, working uh, on this uh, dimension and uh, I wait for your suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Maria. We go to the third and last speaker of this first part of the morning, who is, I hope to pronounce correctly your name, Anneke Lanz. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, from Tallinn University. <clears throat> and she's going to speak about uh, moving in the chasm between languages and memories. Katia Petrovskoviavia. Petrovskoviavia. Uh, maybe. Uh, okay, we'll Thank you. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, great pleasure to be here. So I'm uh, working in comparative literature and in memory studies, and I have an ERC project uh, uh, called Translating Memories, the Eastern European Past on the Global Arena, where we look at how uh, aesthetic media of memory, literature, film and art have participated in this endeavor to make Eastern European memories um, uh, known uh, to global audiences. So uh, I'm not working in the field of uh, semiotics, uh, neither in digital uh, approaches to memory, uh, but uh, I hope in my um, presentation to, uh, like I'm arguing for a more close attention to language in, uh, in, in Petrovska's book. And so here I'm <clears throat> kind of drawing uh, on my uh, BA uh, training in, um, in uh, semiotics and, and structuralist um, theories of uh, language. Uh, so, uh, and I will try to make some connections with, um, with the presentations um, in this panel. So uh, I started to work on, uh, on this book, uh, Kati Petrovska's uh, Vielleicht Esther, uh, maybe Esther, last uh, December. So imagine my uh, um, shock when the war in Ukraine started, because Petrovska is, uh, is um, this book is a family history uh, of a Jewish Ukrainian writer. Uh, um, she's uh, her first language is Russian, but the book is written in German. So it's um, um, it's this uh, this book crosses many boundaries uh, and actually writes about, for example, evacuation from Kiev, bombing of Kiev in, in uh, 1941. So it was really uncanny uh, to work on this book uh, this spring. Uh, so in, in, in scholarship, the book is placed in uh, mainly in two uh, frames of uh, reference. Uh, firstly, on, uh, in, a, in the context of multilingual German Jewish literature and in post-memorial Holocaust literature. And my aim in this paper is, is to show that actually these frames are uh, strongly limiting the, um, the uh, potential of uh, what Petrovska, Petrovska is doing in this book. 
uh, both in terms of um, uh, multilingualism, uh, but also in terms of transnational remembering. And uh, despite the specific focus on multilingualism uh, um, in many readings of this book, I think not close, uh, not um, uh, close attention has been paid to the uh, Petrovska's poetics. So what she does in in terms of um, um, in terms of um, language. <clears throat> Uh, so I, I want to show that Petrovska constructs her family history in a narrative that plays with materiality of language, uh, uh, deploys prose rhymes, homonymity, uh, and other sound associations, and also thirdly uh, uses um, idiomatic expressions across languages to um, <clears throat> sorry to allow for transfer and, um, and uh, pro proliferation of, of meaning. And uh, uh, in this paper, I'm drawing on uh, a new discussions in world literature studies, uh, so um, uh, on an understanding of multilingualism that goes beyond just adding languages uh, and studies uh, trans and postlingual uh, practices in contemporary literature. And I draw on these um, ideas to explore how Petrovska writes transnationally at the borders of uh, languages. And, uh, and uh, I will also ask how this transnational poetics uh, uh, on the level of language translates into transnational remembering. Uh, so I will argue that uh, German Jewish literature and Holocaust memory, uh, though obviously useful and important for understanding Petrovska's text, um, they limit the recognition of its potential as translingual project of transnational memory of the 20th century uh, European past. Um, so, uh, in the prologue of the book, Petrovska sees herself as trelochnik, uh, so she uses the Russian word, uh, which means pointsman or switchman, so actually points woman or a switchwoman on the railway. So, and this uh, becomes one of the central metaphors of translation uh, in this book. Uh, so Petrovska is somebody who will uh, translate um, uh, or write transna translationally uh, at the borders of different languages, uh, mostly uh, German and Russian, but also Polish, Yiddish and, and English. But she will uh, also um, uh, translate the scarce fragments of, uh, of her family heritage um, and findings from the archives into her um, uh, consciously provisional uh, family history uh, and also move back and forth between Holoc the Holocaust memory and, and uh, the memory of Soviet repressions. Uh, so scholars who read uh, maybe Esther as a representative text of the new wave of multilingual German Jewish literature identified as such because Petr Petrovska is Jewish and she writes not in her first language Russian but in uh, in German. Uh, so, but my uh, I, I want to show how these categories are really provisional for Petrovska. Uh, and one of the main triggers uh, for her research into family history, this book is, is um, representing, is the fact that she grew up in the, in, uh, as a Soviet citizen um, in a context of Soviet repressive politics of um, citizenship and memory, uh, which really downplayed the uh, ethnic background of, um, of people. So she hardly knew she's Jewish, which is very difficult to understand in Europe and in North America. <clears throat> so uh, the text is really a discovery of her Jewish background, which as an identity remains uh, at a distance uh, from her until the er very end of the book. Uh, so she calls her Jewish identity her internet Jewishness because she studies the family history uh, with the help of internet. Uh, and, and in an interview, she has stated that writing about World War II as a, I quote, um, Jewish, Ukrainian, Russian speaker, or if you're a kid of Soviet war prisoners and Holocaust victims, you have a moral right on your side. You, do, you are among victors and, and victims. But she clearly disavows this, uh, what she calls victim bonus, 
and, and says it's my story, but it's it's not me. And the same provisionality is actually characteristic of her languages. Uh, so, and I argue both German and Russian. Um, so German, which is the original language of the book, is second or third or even fourth language uh, for Petrovska. And it's, um, its choice doesn't have to do so much with the migrant. She lives in Berlin, so it, it, but, uh, but her choice of German is not of a migrant author wanting to become a writer in, in her country of destination. Uh, but it has more to do with the theme of the book. Uh, and, and she has explained that in order to write about the loss, uh, so uh, uh, her family, there are many Holocaust victims in her family. Uh, she says that this loss is difficult to convey. Uh, and she that for this reason, she had to choose a language that uh, that she doesn't master and that uh, in which she writes with difficulty. Uh, in order to, um, sorry, um, I quote, to create the greatest resistance. And she also says that the book is a translation into, ger into German, but it doesn't have an original. So uh, world literature scholar uh, Rebecca Wolkovich has, um, has uh, described uh, the situation in relation to other transnational authors as uh, writing original uh, originals in target languages. So Petrovska is somebody who chose to um, write in, in one of her additional languages for specific uh, thematic reasons linked to the, uh, to the book and actually intends to write in other languages. In, uh, in interviews, she has stated that she now tries to write in Russian. So this was her first book, the one in, uh, in, in German. Uh, so, so much about her relationship to German, but her relationship to Russian, uh, which is apparently, um, uh, which is consistently treated as her uh, original language or the native tongue by all the scholars, uh, is uh, actually also very ambivalent uh, because she says in a book that her relatives moved from Warsaw to Kiev during the World War I. Uh, perhaps solely in order to forget to me the Russian language, thereby losing the Yiddish in, in that context. So when the family moved from Warsaw to Kiev, they were Yiddish speaking in Warsaw, but then they became Russian speaking in Kiev. So, um, so she also explains that Russian language was that gave identity to her Soviet family, the proud heritage of all of us who knew what is desperation in the face of the fate of one's homeland. And usually uh, uh, um, scholars working in German studies, they see it as a, as a, as a sign of identification with Russian, but actually they, mo I mean, they really miss the irony that is uh, really uh, transparent for me as, a, as an Eastern European in this statement um, about Soviet uh, imperialism. So, what she's saying here is that her native language is that of Soviet imperialism that erased her, uh, both her ethnicity, religion, and also previous languages in her family. Um, so, uh, so mostly the previous research into this book, into um, the scholars who have written about uh, maybe Esther, they usually distribute Petrovska's different languages uh, binarily to different identity, identities she has, or to what Anette Bühler Dietrich has called different affective, memorial, and political functions. But I want to argue that um, Petrovska is really trying to move beyond these binary correspondences. And now I'm drawing on again on Rebecca Wolkovich in World Literature Studies. Um, to highlight how many discussions of multilingualism actually remain entrenched in, uh, in so-called monolingual paradigm that posits a national language that is possessed by native speakers and, um, and un understands multilingualism as merely adding languages. So it really, uh, even if multilingualism is discussed widely in relation to Petrovska, uh, um, 
according to me, uh, um, this discussion doesn't actually um, fully appreciate the radical potential uh, Petrovska has in, in using multilingualism. Uh, so her multilingualism is different um, to use Volkovich's um, uh, terms because it o operates within, across and underneath languages that only uh, that have only appeared to be coherent and distinct. So she, Petroska really wants to, to try to stay in the position of the, of the Strelochnik, the switch woman, uh, to write between uh, uh, two languages. Um, and she, she's, she has these uh, various quotes about this standing on, on the border of languages, like uh, moving in a, uh, just between languages in exchange, in exchange of roles uh, and points of view. Uh, and she also compares her uh, in between us to, uh, in, uh, between languages to querying gender roles. Uh, so she sees her German as her tacked on gender, as a language tacked on onto my tongue. And she explains that she has changed the writing language, I quote, to inhabit both sides, to experience I and not I at the same time. So when Daniela described how how uh, how the how these boundary toposymbolic boundaries are created uh, for like, the self descriptions, she's really moving in a in an opposite direction that she's trying to talk about her family, her background, her identity, but really without uh, uh, building any, any of these uh, boundaries. So a difficult, uh, challenging uh, project, uh, let's say. Um, and, and Rebecca Volkovich uh, so has drawn attention to a new generation of transnational authors who, instead of either uh, occupying, renovating or transforming dominant languages, uh, as, as many post-colonial authors have done, like Rushdie or, or even Joyce and, and Beckett in, uh, in, um, as Irish authors writing in English. Um, so, uh, Petrovska one, is one of these new, new transnational authors who write translingually, uh, and they, their aim is not to possess the dominant language, uh, by making it their own or developing some kind of uh, personal voice, but to actually unpossess it um, and to practice what uh, Volkovich has called affirmative not knowing. Um, so in, instead of linguistic over, uh, ownership or uh, linguistic uh, fluency in this new language, they actually work with, uh, with um, partial fluency uh, and, and um, so, uh, like value linguistic hospitality uh, in, instead of ownership. As and and as we uh, saw from some of the Petrovska statements, uh, her non fluency in German is really instrumental for this uh, as a writing language uh, for for this memorial project she's engaged in. So she's not trying to violently take possession of German or occupy or transform it, um, but instead to play with uh, materiality of language, both um, letters and sounds, and to create meaning in a just between languages. Uh, and uh, I'm arguing that uh, in doing that, she also uh, makes it strange even for native speakers of German. So this process of unpossessing uh, language is, is really um, uh, also uh, valid for, for German readers of this book. And now I want to discuss uh, the, uh, three um, translingual practices uh, um, uh, that uh, Petrovska engages in. So the first is drawing attention to the materiality of language. The second is um, uh, deployment of prose and head rhymes and um, homonymity uh, to transfer and disseminate meaning, and then the use of idi idiomatic expressions across uh, languages. So first, the materiality of language. Uh, so part of her strategy of de-automatizing uh, languages and thereby unpossessing them 
uh, is to make readers sensitive to the materiality of language. Um, so in the prologue of the book, um, she discusses uh, at length uh, an advertisement slogan that hangs in the central station Berlin. Uh, uh, and she says that these huge capitalized letters uh, of the admit, uh, advertisement weigh on her head, so really engage, like highlighting the materiality of, of letters. Uh, and she also, uh, throughout the book, she uh, discusses the sounds of the words in different languages that create uh, associations. Um, in, in the same language or across languages. So she has like, she says, uh, kosher is a, is a cozy or in German kuscheliges word. Uh, and um, she also, um, her, that the uh, Yiddish family name, her Yiddish family name, Kreslin, uh, she says it's uh, the name that crunches like snow under your feet, like kobrishka, uh, gingerbread between your teeth. So um, uh, associations between Yiddish and, and, and Russian and, and, um, and German. And she also compares her grandmother Rosa's uh, memoirs that uh, she wrote at the onset of her blindness, uh, which are really Ill illegible scribbled lines overwritten on the top of each other um, uh, to the crocketed lace. Uh, and says highlighting the materiality instead of a signifying function of, of uh, language. So she says, I understood that Rosa's writing were not intended for reading, but rather for holding on to a thick, thickly woven, unbreakable Ariadne thread. So this uh, materiality, highlighting the materiality of language was, is the first of these translingual practices. The second one is, uh, prose rhymes, uh, and uh, which she uses extensively to create unexpected associations between the words. So the li links between the signifiers create, uh, created by the rhyme are, are turned into associations between the signified. Um, so for example, when talking about her grandfather, who was a Russian prisoner of war in Mauthausen, Austria, um, but who never talked about his experiences after the war, Petrovskaya creates the metaphor of silence by rhyming um, uh, words in, in prose. So she says, between the armies near Kiev and uh, the armchair in our apartment, a black hole opens up. And here you can see, obviously, it works much be better in, in German, uh, Kessel by Kiev and Sessel in, unser, in unserer Wohnung. So, the translation of the book into English and other languages is a, is a separate topic. Um, and similarly, then when visiting the Mauthausen concentration camp, she's, Petrovska is unable to take uh, in all the written testimonies there and starts to copy them um, to be read later at home. Um, and even if she knows that she probably won't have time ever to do that, she keeps copying and links this activity to redemption uh, just by making the association between rhyming German words Kerät um, and uh, Kerätet, so copy machine and, and uh, saved or, or re uh, um, redeemed. Uh, and she says, as though this machine could serve to salvage something until I began to realize that as usual, I, I was drawing no distinction between uh, a in German word gerettet and uh, and the similar sounding a in gerät uh, and was unwittingly seeking salvation from this machine. So prose, head rhymes and homonymity is the second translingual practice. And the third one I want to discuss is um, idiomatic expressions um, discussed across languages. Um, uh, which, um, so mostly they are directly, uh, they are translated from Russian directly, and then they, they start functioning in German, both uh, as, as idiomatic expressions as, and also as directly translated um, um, expressions. And uh, in a central 
chapter of the book on, so the central chapter of the book is on Babin Yar, the key uh, uh, genocide in Kiev in 1941. And in that chapter, she makes a connection between the story of Achilles and his vulnerable heel. So she takes a Greek myth and the Russian uh, uh, idea uh, for being scared. And I don't know if I have it on the slide. Uh, no, uh, which is in Russian, it's Dushav uh, Pyatyushla, my soul slid into my heels. So that this is the Russian idiomatic expression for being afraid. Um, and then she says that uh, the story about Achilles' mother forgetting Achilles' um, heel, when, when told by Petrovska's own mother to her, scared her so much that it established this connection between Achilles' heel and her soul. So um, she says, I didn't um, I understand why Apollo would guide this arrow to the place where my frightened soul was staring at this very moment. So here you see how, how this Russian, um, the directly translated um, uh, idea makes a connection with, uh, with um, Achilles' myth. Um, and, and really also disperses the meaning. This, this, this practice, by this, using this practice, uh, Badrovska disperses the meaning and makes the connection between immortality of Achilles uh, and the mortality of her soul, uh, uh, Petrovska's soul. She, she has another uh, quote. My mother bathed me in the story in a river of immortality as if I could in this way have taken the shield of immortality, but she forgot my heel, the heel where my soul played by the fear and sensing imminent tomb coiled up. And I knew that everyone has a, to have a nakedness, a heel, a soul, a death, the only proof of immortality there is. In fact, um, so uh, I hope um, um, having been able to show that by these transna translational practices of trans uh, and also uh, she has some postlingual um, practices I have don't have time to discuss. Uh, uh, Petrovska is strange is the monolingual uh, language use and proficien proficiency by uh, hindering smooth signification, uh, not only for whoever reads it, uh, uh, but also for German German readers of, of this uh, book. And um, um, I argue that Petrovska's uh, translingual treatment of languages is also a prerequisite of her truly transnational process of remembering um, that even if being a family uh, history really, as I said, disavows this imperative link between memory and, uh, and identity. And in the last part of the paper, uh, I want to discuss um, uh, uh, so this, this transnational um, processes of remembering in, in, in the book. Uh, so the, this specifically transla uh, translational poetics of memories uh, is dictated by uh, Petrovska's family history that is reflective of complexities of 20th century violent history in Central and Eastern Europe. So her family history includes both experiences of victimhood as well as perpetration, or at least what Michael Rothberg has called implication. So uh, as I said, uh, there are many Holocaust victims in her family but also uh, Soviet prisoners of war, as well as uh, NKVD officials and, and Soviet military engineers. So in, rem in remembering her relatives who were killed in Holocaust in Warsaw and Kiev, uh, Petrovska is placing her family history in the context of a global memory of the Holocaust. But uh, Jessica Ortner has shown that uh, uh, she also translates the lesser known uh, aspects of local Holocaust into the European memory of, um, um, uh, into European memory culture, uh, and namely the Babinyar genocide, the killing, killing of more than 30,000 uh, Kiev Jews um, in the arc of two days in, in September uh, uh, 1941. Um, so, and even if she says that that uh, uh, she would, Petrovska says that she would uh, every right to be the to have this victim bonus. 
she actually uh, self-reflectively always marks and, and also retracts any appropriative moves in, um, in relation to the discovered past of her family. So her ethics of memory is radically non-identitarian um, and she prefers the pain of others to her own pain. But next to the Holocaust, uh, this, and this aspect is really under discussed in, uh, in scholarship, as I said, uh, for, uh, for post-memorial Holocaust memory as a framework really exclude the dis excludes the dis discussion of the Soviet repressions in, in Petrovskaya's book. And, uh, um, and this, as I, as I said, this discussion is, uh, is prompted by the implication of her relatives in the regime for example, Petrovska's paternal grandfather uh, worked for NKVD and, and her uncle for Soviet military um, industry. And her maternal grandfather made a career in Soviet Ukraine agriculture in the 1930s, at the time when Soviet Union was starving to death uh, more than 3 million Ukrainian peasants in, in Holodomor. So she doesn't have enough information about the, uh, the um, complicity of her grandfather in, in this um, uh, history, but, but she doesn't exclude her own implication in, in that history. Um, so the recognition of implication uh, is what makes Petrovska's approach to Soviet past specific, in difference to many, I think, former subjects of Soviet regime who really adopt this fully externalizing anti-communist uh, stance, like for example, in many, many offers and, and um, communities in, in, in the Baltic states. So even if she tries to preserve the emotional closeness to her childhood memories in Kiev, her discussion of her susceptibility to Soviet ideology, ideology is, is brutally honest and, and self-reflexive. And I have a a uh, slide about uh, what she calls Soviet metempsychosis, so obviously in reference to James Joyce, uh, where she explains how uh, all these names are from her family, that names that, uh, uh, what has she says, uh, uh, that transmute the energies between state, soul and machines, so names that are abbreviations of of Soviet slogans and, and, uh, and, uh, and um, uh, ideological uh, expressions. Um, so I will skip to the conclusion. Um, um, yes, while in the Soviet period, the discussion of the legacies of Soviet totalitarianism on a European and global scale has been accompanied by comparative and at times competitive discourses between the Holocaust and, and communist regime. Um, the discussion of many different facets of violent history in Central and Eastern Europe, and also the implication on contemporary generations in Eastern Europe in, in this history, uh, does not take a comparative form in, uh, or competitive form in Petrovskaya at all. Uh, and uh, many scholars who have uh, discussed Petrovskaya's linguistic and memorial practices use Deleuze and Quattari's concepts of uh, resume and deterritorialization, and and I, I basically agree with uh, with that these what, what I described as translingual practices really are rhizomatic uh, in in how they create meaning, but um, uh, but uh, usually uh, this uh, introduction of Deleuze and and Quattari uh, for Petrovska comes in, in the context of the of uh, Deleuze's and Quattari's concept of minor literature, uh, taken from Kafka's uh, Kafka book, their Kafka book. Uh, and for me, this um, the the idea of minor literature really threatens to re-territorialize Petrovskaya. Uh, and so uh, for me, it would be more productive to see her linguistic practice as translingual and her politics of memory, uh, memory as really transnational, so not, not, uh, not any kind of uh, peripheral uh, German-Jewish literature that tries to make an um, intervention into German literature, but, but more, more broadly um, a transnational project. Um, um, and I, I will stop here. Uh, yeah, because of the lack of time. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So, we are over.
posting time and we can enjoy 20 minutes of break. So we start again at 11.30. Thank you. Ah, yeah, I didn't say that, but we will have the discussion at the end of the morning for all the interventions. Uh, I think it's only, it's only